uh, Professor Salim, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Salim was very kind in saying that, yes, I am a little bit tired. I arrived at 3 a.m. Malaysian time, which is 5 a.m. here. And I didn't get very much sleep on board the plane. As you know, it's a rather awkward time, seven hours of flight. But then in between, you have to have your dinner, your this, your that. And before you know it, you know, you only could sleep perhaps about, what, two hours? No, that's a luxury because you also want to see a film or two. <laughs> anyway, um, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted indeed to be here, particularly because the first lecture had provided all the technical things that we may want to know. So I can skip very fast on it because I am not in the field. My background is that of an electrical engineer, and uh, I have been rather pushed into it in a way to chair this rare earth task force for the Academy of Sciences. The reason was simple. The general elections, uh, as you have known perhaps, which was held in May the 5th, was a very exciting occasion because uh, the actual politicking had been going on for years, literally. And one of the key issues was Linus. And uh, indeed, I think it was that that really triggered uh, our interest to come here this morning because we have five of us. So whatever I do not know about the technical side of rare earths, I have the backing of this four people, other people, two of whom are geologists, and uh, one chemical engineer, and this one nuclear physicist. So uh, with that to back me, I feel a bit more comfortable. But my only connection with mining, and I must say this, my grandfather was a miner. But let me tell you, it is not one of the sophisticated mining that we talk about with dredging or any kind of, uh, even uh, Palong in Malaysia, you have this kind of uh, sticks and so on. But the one that he used was the basic dulang washing. It's a kind of a tray where a couple of what they call coolies sort of turn around. And uh, he had about 25 or so. He made enough money. I mean, this is the turn of the century, the last century, to have three wives, 20 children, a big house, horse-drawn carriage, mind you. We didn't have running water, but he had somebody to draw the water from the well. And 14 other servants. I'm not exaggerating. This is what actually happened uh, in Pera, which is one of the places that we know that has rare earths. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I must say that the presentation this morning, particularly, uh, well, I suppose both Professor Salim and <laughs> uh, Roderick uh, had actually helped a lot. So I can skip quite a number of slides as far as my slides are concerned. <coughs> but first, I have to give you a bit of a background of Malaysia. And you can see this. A very simplified figures, of the per capita GDP. We are not yet a developed country. Some people say we are trapped in the, well, uh, mid, uh, we are not yet there. But this is one of our objectives, of course, to be a developed country by 2020. So our GDP, as you can see, uh, nominal is only about 10,000 USD. Now, um, as far as the definition of green economy is concerned, it is important in a way for us to at least feel that we know what we're talking about, at least I know what I'm talking about. One that results in improved human well-being and social equity while significantly reducing environmental risks and ecological scarcities. And we talk about green economy, one which is also low carbon, resource efficient and socially inclusive. But I know this is all, you know, all had to all of you here. What I like to play on is basically how these ideas of green economy has 
ignited so many environmentalists in the world. Now they talk about triple bottom line when you talk about anything that hinges on green economy, the social, environmental, and the economic impacts. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I did mention earlier on about the election. Because we realized, because of that election, how important, how impactful, how problematic the social interaction is, or the lack of it. Incidentally, it is this that attracted us to come to Brisbane. And uh, Professor Salim Ali was kind enough to attend uh, our own symposium or seminar in Kuantan, Pahang, the home of Linus. And uh, because of his presence, and he was there, and he saw how strong the opposition was, although they're a very small group, because we did it in the university atmosphere, uh, they didn't actually come in big numbers. Initially, we were thinking of doing it in the town hall or in one of the hotels in the city uh, of Kuantan, but we feared that the previous experiences, when the government agencies tried to engage with the uh, local population, it was a place, uh, I suppose, as big as this, about 100 odd, but about a thousand people turn up. They were not all from the locality. They came up from all over the country. And nobody could make sense because there's too many, too many people, too much shouting, booing, and so on. I, I, I didn't want to show the video. <laughs> I felt a bit embarrassed. But I could see, and we could see in Malaysia, how hot such social events can be. In other words, when we manage it badly, I think this is what uh, Professor Salim diagnosed, and I think he made the right uh, diagnosis. But ladies and gentlemen, ironically, this was, this was not the first time Malaysia has rare earths. As you can see, we actually had been producing rare earths uh, what we call the Asian rare earth from 1982 to 1993. As a matter of fact, let me see if it works. Oh, yeah. Now, this uh, Asian rare earth plant, incidentally, was not the only plant that we had. We had also several other smaller plants, but less dramatic and did not attract that much attention. But this one did because there was some leakage of radioactive substance. In fact, it was the waste. And then there came a huge number of people who claimed that uh, defective babies, that people got leukemia, that people died of cancer. Actually, from 1982 to 1993, there was hardly a year that went without any sort of demonstration, any court cases about this. And Interestingly, however, when it was closed in 1993, and I'm talking about the Asian rare earth plant, which is jointly owned by a Japanese company and the local uh, investors, it was closed because of what the, one of the slides shown earlier on by Roderick, that China came into the act and brought the cost of production down. And it was the same case even in Rodia, in La Rochelle, in France. It was closed down because China pressed down the price. So it was not about court cases. In fact, uh, Russian Red Earth actually won the court case uh, at the end of the Court of Appeal. But, you know, too late because the cost of production just killed them. So ladies and gentlemen, why did we come back? Why did we want to go back into rare earth? Well, the answer lies in the commitment to green economy. And uh, lo and behold, our new prime minister, well, now not so new because he's coming into his real <laughs> second term now, he made a, a claim in this particular conference at Copenhagen in 2009 
that Malaysia will reduce its carbon emission intensity per GDP to 40 percent by the year 2020 compared with the 2005 levels. And of course, there, there is a proviso subject to assistance from developed countries, financial and technical. But whatever it was, he was serious about it because several legislations were passed in Parliament, among which was the green technology, a creation of the uh, National Green Technology and Climate Change Council, of which he chaired himself. The Prime Minister chaired himself on this. There was also legislations on renewable energy and updating of that in renewable energy as well as energy efficiency. There is another one on the feed-in tariff, which was based on the German experience. So this particular picture is been of that uh, feed-in tariff. And, uh, of course, the renewable energy, uh, including the green buildings, which is one of the uh, government schemes. So much so that the Prime Minister's department himself, he ensure, or he made sure that there was, it was retrofitted with green technology. It cost millions, though, because it was not designed initially uh, to have water recycling and so on. But it was done. So he was serious about it. Commitment to green, I suppose we talk about six sectors again, as I said, I like to quote these people because they are the uh, people who met it nowadays, the NGOs, the activists. So Carl Burkett is one of them. And again, he covered this area of renewable energy that has been talked about, green buildings. Actually, this green building here, <laughs> the color is literally green. But if you notice that the roof, it are uh, solar cells at the top. And this also has, uh, um, in fact, minimized uh, light so that we can maximize natural light. And uh, they claim that uh, there is actually a reduction of uh, people going sick, medical leave reduced when you use natural light. I don't know uh, whether this is so or not, but they seem to have some statistics to support this. And there is also uh, rainwater harvesting among other things. So it does qualify for uh, this LED uh, construction uh, certificates and so on. So in other words, we are also going into these areas, into these territories like transportation. We're using more and more of the LRT, MRT. If you're going to, if you are in Kuala Lumpur today, you will see a lot of construction in the city because this new project has come up, come about. And uh, it is intended to reduce the traffic congestion uh, in the city. So green, clean transportation or using electricity is one of those areas. Now, I've seen this just, just now. It's also been shown by others. But water management, uh, waste management, this has been talked about, uh, land management, organic agriculture. But it was interesting that someone raised just now about agriculture and, and rare earths. In a, one of our visits, in fact, our visits to China, uh, we made a visit to the Chinese Rare Earth Society. Do you know how many people work or members of this Chinese Rare Earth Society? There are professionals and graduates and uh, postdoctorals and so on. 110,000 people. 110,000. I think that is a big number to think about. And uh, they are all over uh, China, not just in Baotau and a few of the other well-known places. Nevertheless, I think, uh, yes, it does seem to be uh, all-embracing where rare earths are used. However, it is important, of course, for us to realize that not all aspects of green technology uh, have rare earths in it. And, uh, but what was surprising was it is quite high, that, as we have seen here. I like to touch upon this uh, because it is linked with Malaysia's economy. And I did mention earlier on about Vision 2020. Now, there are, well, quickly just four components to this. One is a, is a very nice, uh, the first one is there's a One Malaysia, People First. Um, well, this is uh, performance now and so on. I mean, these are, 
I suppose, uh, very good gimmicks. But the second one is more important in the sense that government transformation program. And the third is economic transformation. And the fourth is our conventional five-year plans. Now, why do I want to show this? It's because while we talk about the rare earth sector, we believe that the reason why, in fact, Linus came to Malaysia was based on practical things. We had electricity, reasonably cheap, subsidized electricity. We have availability of water. I understand that in time, there are times in Australia where you are short of water, but in Malaysia, uh, we do have reasonable amount of water, particularly in the uh, place where Linus is. We also have uh, reasonably good uh, communication and land, physical infrastructure, airport and seaport and so on. Anyway, I'll show you a little later what we have. But let's have a look first at the uh, government transformation program. Now, these are things which are very, very practical things we are talking about. We are talking about reducing crime, fighting corruption. All governments do this. But what made this different? is that they have key performance indicators for the first time, seriously looked at. As a matter of fact, just before the election, the Prime Minister was bold enough to present to the nation a report card as to how all these initiatives actually have been achieved, what kind of uh, success that they have or otherwise. And it was quite open, quite transparent. Now, the next is the economic agenda. I do not want to go into detail, but these are some of the indicators that they have shown that, yes, it is possible to improve the economy if you measure it and focus and put money into specific areas. That is why it was mentioned here as vertical takeoff. However, there is a need for a reality check. We are in ASEAN, and ASEAN is growing fast. and the competition is fierce. We make no bones about it. Vietnam is growing very fast. Cambodia, even Laos and Myanmar, Thailand and Indonesia. So we are in a very competitive environment. I'd just like to go quickly on this because uh, we all know Adam Smith. But I, used, I like to look at the land, labor, capital, enterprise as a way to look through what we have been discussing about. Although nowadays people include uh, knowledge as one of the factors of production as well as energy. But that's just a quick one. Because I'm coming to this looking at the report that was prepared by the Academy of Sciences Malaysia on rare earth industries moving Malaysia's green economy forward. I have a copy of this report here, as a matter of fact. And there we propose seven strategies. The first is enhance environment, safety and health. Because clearly this was one very troubling notion for the people to know how safe are the industrial estates that has been uh, that where Linus was, in fact, as well as other industrial estates in Malaysia. Second strategy was to undertake a national exercise to map in detail the potential rare earths, alluvial as well as hard rock deposits and their economic potential. I have another book here, which is uh, Revitalizing the Rare Earth Mineral Program. This is still hot from the press. This only came out last week. And uh, actually, it is in a way a bit of a misnomer because they always wanted to revitalize tin. But so far, it has not been that popular because people associate tin with the abandoned old tin mines and so on and leaving a lot of uh, uh, environmental problems. But people know that those people who are engaged in mining in Malaysia, there are a lot of new mining technologies that can be very environmentally friendly. Anyway, third is incentivizing upstream, incentivizing midstream. 
and incentivizing downstream. What we are seeing here is upstream meaning, of course, the uh, mining, uh, prospecting and so on. And midstream is actually the processing part because we have been told that it is not just Linus producing it, you have to do another few steps after Linus. And there's a potential in that midstream effort. And then downstream will be the manufacturing uh, that has been covered by the previous speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, number five, of course, is to build the key competence in human capital. And this is one of the reasons why we are here, actually, because we're also looking at linking up with universities in Australia that have mining, and uh, because we know that Australia is actually a mining country. And, and, and the place where, because of the proximity, uh, is a logical place for Malaysia to look at. Number six is to look at the legal and regulatory framework. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think uh, we have one who's uh, also in the uh, Atomic Energy Licensing Board as one of our uh, members who are here today. And uh, we, number seven is looking at an undertaking coordinated, comprehensive, continual public awareness program. And this is clearly taken out from uh, Professor Salim Ali's suggestion. But we actually have put it uh, in our report, although not that well presented the way he did uh, in Pahang. And therefore, I had to show this picture. I uh, only take a small one because there's too many, too many people involved in various, uh, and they all are dressed in green and uh, all sorts of uh, uh, signs that have been, but I just take one small one, not really to downplay it, but just to give a sense of, yes, it does happen, and it happened in great big numbers, but I could not get the pictures in time for this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gebeng, the place where Linus is, and uh, they are developing this Gebeng Harbour City. As I said earlier, it is not just one plant, Linus, there, and I think Professor Salim also mentioned the BASF there. There are over 19 or 20 other uh, chemical plants uh, in that area. And the latest that has come in close to this place is Malaysia China Kuantan Industrial Park. This was launched uh, in uh, February uh, this year. So they have the port, as I mentioned earlier, they have the facilities, the infrastructure, the materials, the bankings, uh, and so on. And the university, there's University of Malaysia, Pahang, uh, very close by. So operationalizing the strategies, how do we do it? Now this is where we said that we were talking about land. Now previously, these were the mining areas. This is a very old map but they are alluvial. Now we think we should be looking at the mountain range, that side. And there was also comments uh, two days ago looking at the sea, because our Straits of Malacca is a fairly shallow uh, sea between um, Peninsular Malaysia and uh, Sumatra. And uh, we're also looking at uh, developing human capital in, from the universities and polytechnics, I shall cover a little later. But these two states, in Sabah and Sarawak, also promises a lot of minerals. And some say Sabah is uh, perhaps the richest state uh, in Malaysia today because of its rich mineral resources. So this is why we feel that we need to do proper mapping of our resources. And one of our key uh, proposals to government is that this must be done. And uh, well, this is just to show the universities that exist. We have uh, 44 universities, uh, 25 university colleges for a population of 28 million. Uh, it's a pretty good ratio, I think. So these are some of the universities, and these are various uh, other routes uh, for manpower or human capital development. Capital, the other important resource. And Bangnagara, in fact, 
in Malaysia, it uh, has been performing rather well because you recall that when we had the economic or actually currency crisis in 1997, I think Malaysia is the only country in Southeast Asia that did not take up the IMF offer. And the reason for that is that we have these institutional investors. We have one more, which I did not put there, unfortunately, the Employees Provident Fund, which is a huge amount of money, and that they have been able to sustain, and we were able to with, uh, withstand the onslaught of the currency attacks by, uh, well, the money, the currency traders. And we have investment bankers. So, in a sense, if we are going to the next step of developing our own mines, our own upstream, downstream, midstream, I believe we have, on top of that, we also have what is called Khazana. This uh, Khazana Malaysia, which is actually a sovereign wealth fund. And they have uh, quite a bit of money, and as well as Pilgrim Fund, because they also invest, they are big investors into many of the Malaysian companies. Well, you have seen all these figures, but what perhaps is uh, what I wanted to draw are these are two areas. These are from Malaysia's own uh, sources, similar to this. And so what we are looking at is that, yes, we do have rare earths in Malaysia, and the question is whether or not they are in economic quantities to exploit. I wanted to put another chart because the figure actually come down a little bit now, as we saw just now. Nevertheless, yes, it has been going down for a few months and it has been discussed earlier, but there seems to be a leveling up of uh, the uh, index. And this has also been covered by others, so I will not go into detail. What we are saying is there are opportunities for Malaysia and for Malaysia to go into the production, into the downstream uh, exercise in these uh, magnets, lasers, and so on. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we had also mentioned about critical materials that exist, and we are also just looking at the various things that Malaysia do have, and therefore, perhaps we can go into investments in these areas. So, concluding, ladies and gentlemen, in spite of the hiccups, in spite of the poor liners that had to suffer some delays in their uh, coming on stream, liners is greatly, greatly welcomed by scientists in Malaysia, by the technologists and engineers. Contrary to the kinds of uh, stop liners, save Malaysia publicity that the world have seen. Because it also puts Malaysia on the rare earth map, we believe that it will trigger economic growth, upstream, midstream and downstream activities. And I would like, and we would like to thank Australia for this new potential for economic growth in Malaysia. Thank you very much. So I think uh, in terms of uh, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia is on the same boat actually uh -huh. because we are entering uh, the tin belt. Yes. Basically. Yes. And then uh, I know that so we have like uh, something that we have to tackle because when we are trying uh, to improve uh, our rare earth minerals, we are looking at not only rare earth elements but we are looking at. A nuclear thing as well in there, and I think that's the challenge that we have to tackle in the future. I'm just wondering what, uh, how the uh, Malaysian government is going to do about it. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. As usual, perhaps when we started out, uh, like many other countries, we make mistakes. I mentioned to you about the Asian rare earth plant that has to be shut down. And when it was shut down, they did have quite a lot of thorium. But unfortunately, the thorium, being radioactive, was, what they say, neutralized, where they dumped in 
concrete and so on and it's uh, very well protected so much so that we cannot get access to the thorium anymore so i believe that what was done in france i was mentioning just now at rodia la rochelle and dr ahmad was one of the first to mention it to us in malaysia and says look rodia actually had this huge quantity of thorium, I cannot recall how many thousand tons that they had, a few thousand tons, right smack in the middle of their plant, which is only two kilometers away from this beautiful seaside resort, La Rochelle. It is actually so close that you can see the lighthouses from where uh, the thorium was stored. So this idea of a storage of storium has got to be far away from everywhere and so on. Uh, I thought it was not necessary. But we overkilled when we were tackling the Asian rare earth problem. We did not think about the potential economic use that the thorium that we had you know, can be uh, utilized. But I feel that now we are a little bit wiser. And I think that in future, we'll be looking at other ways of making sure it should be safe, of course. But we believe that other people have already learned how to do it. So what we need to do is to learn from the others how to exploit it. You're quite right, because we actually have a lot of uranium combined with the thorium. And I know that uh, the tin tailings, uh, mining tailings that we had, was actually very radioactive uh, before. I hope that answers you a little bit. I think uh, Indonesia has problem too. Yes, please. Are there two? Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Lyon. My question is about the green economy, because this is my research here at the University of Queensland. Uh, and considering that Malaysia has, has experienced actually in rare earth elements, I'm curious, based on the previous experience you had, whether there are environmental policies that the Malaysian government has already in place in conjunction with the current emphasis or maybe the plan of the Malaysian government to, 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 really, to, to implement policies and strategies with relevance to the green economy or circular economy. And I think in terms of rare earth elements, it looks like that it is very critical also to understand the resource efficiency component of these green economy principles. And I'm just curious, what are those policies or strategies that the, the Malaysian government is pursuing? Thank you very much. <clears throat> As I said earlier uh, in my presentation, that the government, headed by the Prime Minister himself, uh, is interested. But as Prime Minister, he does not have a science background. So he has a science advisor. And not just one science advisor, he also now has, uh, of course, the Academy of Sciences have been one of those that provide inputs to him. But there is a council of professors. I'm not sure how many countries in the world have council of professors. But our professors in Malaysia formed a council. Almost all, I think, all the professors are members of this council. Not all of them are pro-government, of course. <laughs> but we do know that they have got clusters where they then give inputs uh, from the academic standpoint to the top. Now, there is also top-down, of course, uh, decisions that are made. Uh, previous Prime Minister, you must have heard of Dr. Mahade. Dr. Mahade himself, being a medical doctor, he had science background. So in some ways, some of the things that started by him was because of his deep interest uh, in science in general. And that made it a lot easier for a number of policies to have started. For instance, uh, I think one of the critical things that started by him was this idea of looking at IT. Uh, and IT, and he, therefore he created this uh, place called Cyber City, uh, close to Putrajaya, Cyberjaya. And that was supposed to house all the new IT uh, plants, companies, and so on. 
Now, in terms of green economy, as you know, uh, it is not just one thing. It is actually a conglomeration of a uh, number of uh, uh, things that can, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, that impact upon uh, to get at this idea. But what was exciting to me was that when a whole new ministry was created, green technology as part of the ministerial commitment. So the ministry, once it was announced by our new minister, just now I mentioned about Dr. Singh Najib, they then even called our academy to help them formulate what are the ideas about green economy? And we ourselves also, you know, uh, searching and grouping. But it's, it is a start where the academicians, the people from the universities, research institutes, were gathered together to form and discuss in workshops. They call it laboratories now, labs, 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 you know, several labs. They're trying to come up with uh, ideas and policies as to how to privatize, uh, how to optimize and, and uh, prioritize what are the things to be done. It is still work in progress. I don't say that we have already got it all in, you know, uh, uh, cast in stone, but it is something that is ongoing and each new minister will bring more improvements or suggestions to that particular policy. But I think if you uh, even just Google on Green Technology Malaysia, you'll find a whole list of uh, policies that has been enacted and passed by Parliament. But it is ongoing. It has not stopped there yet. Thank you. Yes, there's another question at the back. Yeah. I'm John Tynes with Greenfields Research. Um, I was just wondering, on the tin mining side of things, um, having looked at what's happened in Indonesia with tin mining uh, bank of Bilotum, alluvial, that is not alluvial mining, is generally not very sustainable. And I'm not sure, does that really map to a green economy type focus? I mean, I'm wondering, maybe, if my understanding with the, the rare earths and the tin mining, it doesn't become a waste from the mining process comes out as in the smelter sites, and is that not a better focus for um, sort of extraction of mineral processing side of things? And the other issue that sort of worries me is the, the, the issue with thorium. As far as I'm aware, there's still not really a major market for thorium. There's an idea that it might be used in nuclear power generation, but that's a very slow moving in industry. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> well, I would like to invite my colleague. Uh, he was a director general of geoscience. He is the best person to speak on the subject. In fact, he's also got another, <laughs> his deputy beside him as well. Dato Fatih Chan. Uh, from the Academy of Science. As far as the riots are concerned, they actually with the monazite and uh, xenotin. These are the byproducts of tin mining. They don't come down the smelter, they're separated. They're then handed over to what they call the uh, Amang uh, dressers. These people buy the byproducts of tin mining within the country and also in the region. They separate the monazite from the xenotin, and then this monazite and xenotin are sold overseas because the Asian riots closed down. Otherwise, Asian riots was cracking the monazite, and there was another one called Malaysian Riot Corporation for striking the Zenotin. So those have been closed down. Now, coming back to what? Uh, uh, the thorium. Thorium, uh, yeah. The thorium that is found, actually, there's a little bit of thorium with the monazite, a uh, little bit of uranium. In monazite, there's more thorium than uranium. In Zenotin, there's more uranium than thorium. But that is, you only have the problem if you crack it. And if you crack that, and if you want to recover the thorium, uh, that I would say there is already an interest shown in the use of thorium for power generation. One of the reasons is actually US started at Oak Ridge, their first thorium-based uh, nuclear power plant, which they ran for a couple of years, then closed down. Uh, and they proved that thorium can be used. But in the world today, Power has been generated mainly by uranium plants, uh, nuclear power from uranium. 
But with this interest, why is the interest in thorium? Uh, thorium has is uh, less radio has less radiotoxicity. <coughs> it is uh, better or more efficient as far as power generation is concerned. Has less wastage. You don't have the problem of disposal of your productive waste. Um, I think China has taken a great interest in thorium now, using the molten salt reactors. In fact, they took the blueprints from US, <laughs> and they've got they got thousands of PhDs working on it. Although thorium reactors are about 20 years down the line, it, but I think with China's great interest, it may be speeded up. So there will be a future for thorium the way we look at it, and maybe La Rochelle is keeping their thorium. Many other countries might do likewise. So that's the status at present. Thank you. Yes, uh, let us. There's one more here. Last question. <laughs> we have time for discussion. Um, let's start with a from a uh, gas company. Uh, just for your information, I grew up in Swanton. Oh! <laughs> but I, I, I live and uh, work now for a social performance line for a gas company in Queensland. Uh, my question is, in your opinion, uh, were the health issues associated with uh, Asia Rare company, um, was that a perceived health issue or was it a real health issue? And the uh, second question is, okay. in, in your opinion, has Linus closed the gap around uh, environmental and social impacts they might have on the people? Thank you. The first question is whether it was perceived or not. Uh, I think the uh, problem that we faced was we didn't do what Professor Salim suggested. That is this methodical engagement right from day one, even at the time when you start the plant, get people to be involved, get people to understand the extent of radiation and the potential dangers if there are. So to some extent, I look at the conclusion by the High Court judge, by the Court of Appeal actually, that on balance, there was no evidence that has been uh, given to the court, although several reports were submitted by several researchers, NGOs and so on, to support the claim that that particular Asian red earth plant gave rise to the kinds of things they talked about, the uh, birth defects and uh, uh, leukemia and so on. Because statistically, it did not show. And uh, if I can mention also that when we were in Beijing, Professor Yan was asked a similar question as to whether people who work in the factories, in, in the factories, rare earth factories in China, uh, you know, showed this kind of health problems, the workers. And apparently, although he did not have adequate samples, he said, but the present data that he had uh, showed there was no statistical backing to this. As a matter of fact, he said that statistics show that people happen to be healthier, which was, I suppose, you know, not something people want to hear about, whether records really helped this or not. But I think basically not enough research has been done to support one way or the other. So with that in mind, when we started with Linus, we urged the government to have a baseline study health study of people around uh, Linus as well as the other plants and take it periodically so that you have some data to work on as to whether people who get you know, sick, everybody gets sick anyway, and I think Professor Salim was mentioning that uh, people, uh, one of the uranium uh, mines, uh, somebody died, oh, 20,000 people and only one person died and he happened to be a smoker rather than, you know, exposed to uranium. I think the difficulty is, of course, to say, why do you die of whatever disease? What are the origin? Is it genetic? Is it uh, something else? That is not easy to determine. But I think the methodology is already there, and we urged the government to actually use that for Linus, for that area. 
Although from our uh, study so far, uh, it doesn't really, because the level of the uh, radiation from lightness is so low, uh, the Asian rare earth one was higher. Line is only about six millisieverts per gram, whereas uh, the Asian rare earth are about what, 45 to 60 millisieverts per gram. So, you know, uh, I frankly uh, do not think. I think it's much more of a hype up uh, thing as far as Linus uh, is, is concerned. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.